Pastor Peter, thank you for leading us in prayer. Advent, it's a time of prayer, it's a time of waiting, a time of hope, a time of longing for God to step into the silence and the darkness. And we're waiting for the Word to become flesh for what is called the incarnation, the way Eugene Peterson translates John chapter 1, verse 14, and we'll get to that verse in a few weeks, is the Word moved into the neighborhood. So this sermon series I've entitled Incarnation, God Moves Into the Neighborhood. We'll be looking about at how Jesus is sent into the world, really for the whole of this school year. Our theme as a church is being sent. So at the end of the Gospel of John, we hear that just as the Father sent me, says Jesus, so I send you. So as we look at these opening verses of the Gospel of John, this is often called the prologue of the Gospel of John. It is a poetic, hymnic, profound introduction to John's telling of the story of Jesus. As we look at that, we're going to find out exactly how Jesus was sent, and that will inform us in terms of our own being sent into our own neighborhoods. That's what we're going to be doing for the whole of Advent, beginning this morning with just the first two verses of John chapter 1. So I'm going to pray, ask that you pray with me, and then we'll hear Holy Scripture together. So Lord Jesus, we believe you're present in this room. Lord Jesus, we do long for your coming. We do wait for your coming. And God, we need you to speak. We need you to show up. We need you to create, to move and do new things in our lives. So open our hearts, our minds to these holy words of Scripture. For Lord, it was your Holy Spirit who raised you from the dead, who enabled your incarnation. God, put flesh to these words, not just in this hearing, but in our very lives, we pray. Amen. Church, this is God's word for us, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Have you had a holy ground experience? You know what I'm talking about? You're in some place, or maybe you're in some moment in time, and because of the holiness of the place, or because of the holiness of the moment, you became wholly aware that there's something, someone beyond you, and you have that I am on holy ground realization. For me, this often happens in nature. So at some point in my 20s, I was backpacking in Colorado. There was this freak hailstorm. I stepped out of the trees into this meadow. Everything was covered with hail, including the trees all around me. It was this amphitheater-like scene in front of me. I could look all the way down to the valley, and involuntarily, I fell on my knees in praise and worship wholly aware of the spirit that was there next to me, that same spirit, I believe, who hovered over creation and created the whole of the world, created the universe, including the hail and the trees and the moonlight and the valley before me. It was a holy ground kind of experience. A couple years ago, I was hiking the Nepali coast with my family. It was a long hike. We were finally getting back. We were racing against the setting sun, which was behind us, but I kept turning around because I couldn't turn away from that scene, the sun setting over those steep cliffs and those dissipating clouds. It was a holy ground kind of moment. Or even just a couple weeks ago in our church parking lot, after the first rain of the season, a rainbow setting over the San Gabriels and over the power lines, um, a holy ground kind of experience. Words also can do that. And certain authors have done that for me. They've ushered me in to the holy. So Dickens has done that for me, and Tolstoy, Tolstoy and Wendell Berry, and Victor Hugo, and Marilyn Robinson ushered me into that which is beyond, that which transcends. And that, I think, is what the gospel writer John does, particularly in this poetic, hymnic introduction to his gospel. Every gospel writer, not just John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, traditionally have an animal associated with them, and John's is an eagle. Here's a picture of a stained glass window that shows that probably because of the soaring language of these opening verses of the Gospel of John. Here is not just 
profundity on the human scale, but truly divinely inspired words. Here we find holy ground in these words. And we're going to step into it for the next few weeks, these, this holy ground of the prologue of John, and hope to be inspired, hope to be led, hope to experience God, and yes, eventually to understand, but the primary response I think that God would urge upon us is one of worship and praise, doxology, ascribing glory to who God is as we step into this holy ground of this opening chapter of John. So, to begin, in the beginning, and with those three words, John begins his gospel. And those are powerful, bold words to start with. Of course, John, with those three English words, two in Greek and one in Hebrew, wants us to think about that other book of the Bible that begins with the same words, in the beginning. John is signaling something important about his topic. He's saying, my treatment of Jesus Christ, my telling of a story of the good news of the gospel, it has continuity with what has come before. That other beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, John is saying what is being done in Jesus Christ, and that's going to be the subject of his whole gospel, it is the primary work of God for us, for our salvation, and it is creative work, just like God's creating in Genesis when the world was formed. This is what God does. When God works, God creates. And by saying in the beginning, John is making sure we know as we step into the holy ground of this story, of the coming of the Son of God, the Word of God, the Word made flesh, that God is doing something new. God is doing something creative in the world and in our lives. So as we look to what God is doing and hope for God to work in our lives, our expectation should be God is going to create something. The old has gone, the Apostle Paul says. The new has come. This is the essence of the gospel. This is what God does over and over and over again. And God will do that again this Advent as we step into this holy ground. So John says, in the beginning was the word. The Greek word there for word is logos. It's an incredibly rich word, has a profound history. Thousands and thousands of pages have been written about this word logos since John used it at the beginning of his gospel. He wasn't the first to use it. John would have read the Old Testament in Greek, what was called the Septuagint, and the translation for the Hebrew word there, debar, is logos. And so John would have read over and over again, as would his readers, who are now reading these words in their community of faith, that the prophets heard the word of God, the logos of God. So that's part of the history of this word. Also, the word was used in Greek philosophy by the Stoics, and also by Philo, a Jewish philosopher, influenced by Plato. And for these philosophers, the logos was that which ordered the chaos of creation. It was the divine word which brought order to creation. And John carries all of that meaning and then uses this word logos in a wholly new, distinct, profound way because he applies it to the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the one who was sent in to the world. And so John says, the word was with God, and that means the word was facing God, was toward God. You know, people you know that listen well, they do that thing when they start listening to you, they shift their body position, at least subtly, and you know they are listening to you. That's the image here at the beginning of the Gospel of John. The word was with God. The word was toward God, was facing God. And then John says the word was God. And here is something wholly new that had never been said about the Logos, that the Logos was God, always had been God, was with God in the beginning. Here truly we are on holy ground. And here is the foundation of what the church fathers would do with the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is Father and is Son and is Holy Spirit. They would take these profound words and build that into this doctrine, this mystery of the Trinity, of who God is. And all of that, I think, is 
richly important. And again, I think praise is due, God, for the Word become flesh who dwells among us, the Word who was with God, who was God. But the main thing to realize is this, if that's who God is, then God has something to say to us. If God is the logos, the Word, that means God was speaking and is speaking. God wants to share who He is with the world, and in fact has been sharing who he is with the world long before there was a world or there was a Nepali coast or there were rainbows. The word has been speaking and sharing the divine essence. God is a revealing God, a speaking God, if God is the word. That, of course, I think begs this question. If God is the word and always has been the word, then why is God so hard to hear? It can be frustrating, can it not? When we long for God to speak and God simply is not speaking, when we cry out and all we hear is silence, the prophet Isaiah expresses that thought. The people of God were in captivity in Babylon, and Isaiah says this, frustrated with the silence of God. Your holy cities, God, have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our ancestors praised you has been burned by fire, and all our pleasant places have become ruins. After all this, will you restrain yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and punish us so severely? If you're like me, you have been, often are, frustrated with the silence of God. Personally, because there's some area of your life, some difficulty, some brokenness, some hurt, some need for healing, some awareness of the presence of God. And like Isaiah, you cry out, God, don't be silent. But what you hear actually is silence. And so we start to fear the silence. And not just alone, I think also together, Corporately, in a faith community like this, or just simply in the world, we long for God to speak. Because we know when God speaks, the world is created. God brings new life and creation. So why doesn't God speak more? Why is it so hard to hear what God is saying? The prophet Elijah had an experience of God speaking. He was fleeing for his life, eventually ended up at Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, that's where the Ten Commandments were delivered to the people of Israel, the Torah, the way, the instruction. So it was a mountain where God had spoken before, and Elijah found himself on that mountain in need of God to speak. He was fleeing for his life. First, there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. The text says God was not in the wind. Next, there was the rumble of an earthquake. God was not in the earthquake. Next, there was the rush of a fire. God was not in the fire. And then there was the sound of sheer silence. And the text does not say God was in the silence, but it certainly indicates that. Another way it's translated is a still small voice was the sound that Elijah heard. God was in the silence. God did not fear the silence. God whispered into the silence and had something to say to Elijah, and I think has something to say to us. And actually, there's the possibility that this is how God speaks, is through a whisper. And maybe the reason we're not hearing is because there's not much whispering going on in our lives. There's a cacophony of sound, and we can't hear the whisper. And we would expect God to break into that rush of sound with an amplified, loud voice. What if, though, God speaks and is speaking through a whisper? This past week, I was spending time, my family was, with some family friends, and I spent about 30 minutes whispering with a three-year-old. So here I am, I'm behind the hat, and that's my friend Sybil, who is three, whose name, by the way, means prophetess in Greek, one who hears the word of God and shares it. And Sybil had secrets to tell me, so we spent a 
half hour whispering to each other, mostly silly words, but there's meaning in silly words. There's also meaning in whispering. Some things are so true, they can't be belted out. They're secrets, not in the sense that they can't be shared, but they need to be whispered. And of course, when you whisper, you're not using your vocal cords. You have to get up close. You have to cup your hands. And when you listen to a whisper, you don't so much hear it, but you feel it, like the feeling of a three-year-old's breath on your ear and on your neck. And what if this is actually how God speaks to us? And what if that's why we're not hearing? Because we're expecting a shout. And instead, God is whispering to us. In the beginning was the whisper, and the whisper was with God, and the whisper was God, and the whisper was with God in the beginning. This is how God steps into the world, incognito, in disguise. It's an unveiling of what has been veiled. It actually has to be a whisper because God has to get up close. God stoops down to us and whispers the word into our lives. This is how God actually does step into our neighborhoods. I've been thinking, like many of you, about neighborhoods. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I used to, as a kid, of course, watch Mr. Rogers, and that was part of my own growing up. I have read the article that the movie was based on, and that article, which was in Esquire magazine about 20 years ago, tells this story about how Mr. Rogers once received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Daytime Emmys. So he was there in this huge crowd, all of these fancy, glittering, well-to-do people in an in a auditorium probably not 25 minutes away from here. And everyone knew he was going to receive this award. So too did Mr. Rogers. He'd been on the air for about 29 years at that point. His name was read by Tim Robbins, the actor. There was thunderous applause, a standing ovation, of course, which lasted a long time. Mr. Rogers deftly stepped up on stage. Tim Robbins was awkwardly holding the award because he had a little speech to give. Everyone kept cheering. Mr. Rogers didn't look awkward at all. I don't think that man's ever felt awkward a moment in his life. Finally, the crowd quieted down, sat down. Mr. Rogers was handed this award, and then... He had a speech to give, a word to share. And we've heard a lot of those speeches. Usually gratitude is expressed. Often the one receiving the award will use it as a platform to share something important to him or to her. Here's what Mr. Rogers did holding that lifetime award. He said, a lot of special people are behind this. Some of them are here, like his wife Joan was in the front row. They've been married for 45 years at that point. He said, some of them are not here. He said, some of them are in heaven. Mr. Rogers, deeply faithful man. Do you know, by the way, he was a Presbyterian pastor. I am so proud of that. (laughs) One of the best things the Presbyterian church ever did was ordain Fred Rogers into that ministry of that television program for children, for adults. So here he is holding this award, and he says this, all of us have been loved into being. And then he said, this. I want you to take 10 seconds, said this to these actors, actresses, take 10 seconds and think about those who have loved you into being. And then Mr. Rogers said, all watch the clock. And he did for 10 seconds. And in that 10 seconds, heads bowed and mascara ran as these men and women came into this truth that they had been loved into being. Tinseltown, I think one of the loudest places on the planet, heard the whisper, you have been loved into being. And I think that's true. And I think there's a whisper even behind that whisper for all of us, not just our our parents and brothers and sisters, friends, teachers who have loved us into being, but what if there is a God who made us, who loved us into being? That is the word. That is the whisper of God. And that whisper can only come in 
the silence. So here's what I would share with you this morning. In fact, here's what God whispered to me this morning. I was going to say at the end of this sermon, there's not enough silence in our lives. Take this time of Advent to find some silence. I think that's pretty good advice. I was also going to say, God is doing something new because this is a work of creation. So look for the new thing God is doing in your life. That's also pretty good input. But here's what God wants you to hear. This is what God whispered in my ear as I was praying this morning. Do not be afraid of the silence. Because we are. We fear the silence. We're afraid when we scream out to God and all we hear is silence, that that's all we get. We fear the silence. Do not be afraid of the silence. Because what if God is whispering into that silence? What if the silence is actually what is needed for us to hear this word of God? Do not be afraid of the silence. For you, men and women, you have been loved into being by the word made flesh. Thanks be to God for him. So we're going to pray. I'd ask the worship band to come back on stage. We're going to sing a familiar Christmas carol about hearing what God has to say. And as we step into that song, I'm going to offer a prayer and also another moment of silence. So church, let's pray together. So Lord Jesus, based on your promises, we do not fear the silence. God, there are those in this room who right now are longing for you to speak. They need a word of assurance, a word of love. They need your creative healing power. And God, we do fear the silence. We do long that you would just speak out loud. But God, we trust you that you are the whisper. And so we would not be afraid. So Lord, as we sing this carol, we ask that you would give us ears to hear. We ask that you would give us the boldness to go where you go, which is into quiet and into silence. And as we do that, may we hear you speak. Listen to us. 